Hi, my name's Bongrenia and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I wanted to first wish you all a happy new year. It's 2020. I hope this will be the year of Lena. And to get the ball rolling, I wanted to discuss a few things that I've been thinking about over the past couple of months. Now, um, in what you're looking at here is P-Table. Uh, it's an interactive um, periodic table uh, that you can get online at ptable.com. And the reason I'm showing you it because I wanted to discuss uh, some aspects of the production of cold ultra low energy neutrinos. These are mass bearing low velocity neutrinos, very different from the uh, relativistic nearly speed of light or speed of light type neutrinos that have basically no mass that you would ordinarily see coming from the sun and, and uh, nu nuclear processes, um, sort of standard nuclear processes. Now, um, uh, the reason uh, I'm showing the periodic table is according to Parkinson's latest theory and uh, the material discussed in his book, um, when you're uh, wanting to synthesize these things, you need to have solids or um, liquids or dense plasmas where the matter is um, at a high density and it also has a temperature in excess of 1000 degrees centigrade. And we'll come on to that a bit later. But the obvious choices for doing that are to have uh, tungsten and carbon. Um, uh, and in fact, if you're looking at boiling point, uh, rhenium actually has a boiling point that's even above tungsten. So of the elements that are available in the Mendeleev table, uh, rhenium has the highest temperature, but it's much more expensive than either carbon or tungsten. And then if you look at uh, compounds, um, there's a guy that suggested, uh, Alan De Angelis on um, ECAT World, he suggested why not think about a compound oh, tungsten carbide. And if you look at tungsten carbide, uh, that indeed does have a temperature, if I can show you, uh, maybe move this around. And uh, in here, the uh, melting point, uh, sorry, the boiling point of that is 6,000 degrees C, which is um, quite a lot higher. It's like 400 or 50, between 400, about 450 degrees higher than the temperature of the surface of the sun. Uh, and so uh, this would be ideal, and we'll come on to those kind of temperatures. But uh, by sharing this information, uh, some people caught on to things that I've been discussing uh, uh, quite a lot uh, with other members of the MFMP. And I think now that the book's out and the theory's out, uh, I think it's very important that um, uh, other people become aware of this also and really connect with it. And and that is that uh, if, if tungsten uh, and tungsten carbide and so on, and maybe we can look at the temperature of, let's have a look at a, a different element here. So we'll, we'll take, a, not tungsten, but we'll take a, a silicon and carbide. So silicon and carbon, silicon carbide, we'll have a look at that. Uh, um, this will become uh, pretty obvious why I'm suggesting to look at these things in the in the very near future. So if you look at silicon carbide here, has it got its melting point here? Yeah, it's, it's nowhere near as high temperature, but it is 2,830 degrees. So it's uh, really quite high temperature, um, uh, you know, than obviously silicon dioxide. It's lower than that. that. Anyway, so. Um, if we go back to the materials, there's there's one other reason I would suggest you re uh, rhenium, and maybe people can think about what I've been saying over the past couple of months um, and uh, uh, look at the properties of rhenium, and I'd like someone to try and guess that. But anyway, um, the reason I was so fixated on tungsten and then silicon carbide uh, was that if we look at uh, Alexander Bar Parkinson's presentation that he gave at, in late December at the Friendship University, he's talking about new approach to the creation of Lena reactors. And, and this is the reactor, the 225 day reactor that produced a maximum COP of 3.6 and 2.1 MeV per nickel atom in the reactor. What I found about interesting about this was a number of things. Uh, just a couple of days before the conference, I found out that the central core was actually silicon carbide, and I've explained how silicon and carbon can breed the massive amounts of calcium that were found uh, after analysis in that area. But the other thing is that he he has been using a tungsten heater wire. And so why would you use tungsten? Well, one, one, one might think that that is because it gets to a high temperature. But I think people have been missing the obvious here. Um, and I don't know why, but if it gets to a high temperature and it's a solid, uh, 
uh, and so does the silicon carbide, then what you have in effect is hot, dense, uh, solid or liquid. In this case, both the silicon carbide and and, and the uh, tungsten is <laughs> obviously not uh, a gas. And so it's at high temperature, so it falls into this... Um, area where it can actually synthesize uh, these type of neutrinos that Parkamov is saying uh, plays an active role in the Lena process or certainly can explain his observations and uh, he's working on this basis. So uh, one might think well that, that you know I, I had this discussion uh, with uh, members of the MFMP why not use a tungsten light bulb well and the conclusion was drawn after my recent statements by a third party and it was asked of Alexander Parkamov you know have you considered using tungsten light bulb and he says yes but the, the mass of the tungsten in there is not enough but we have used tungsten uh, to produce the cold neutrinos and obviously you're seeing it in years of experiments that he's done and and so there's there's this uh, point here um that would be producing the cold neutrinos uh, and uh, that that <laughs> ties into maybe what you might see in something that I showed uh, at the beginning of a year, uh, this year and in fact in years previous and that is this reflector and when I considered that the um, the tungsten or the the hot solid material um, if we were are to accept his theory is producing these uh, ultra cold uh, um, uh, uh, neutrinos, uh, these ultra low energy neutrinos, uh, and he's saying that these uh, have a wavelength that's in the microns to millimeters, and therefore solid matter can reflect them. And particularly metal is, you know, in this case, is a, <clears throat> a good reflector. And he's the the incident uh, cosmogenic ones are coming in, and then they're being reflected onto a radioactive uh, um, a beta isotope, and and it's measuring the uh, in uh, versus uh, beta decay, uh, uh, discriminating for those uh, coming out of that sample. Um, this, <laughs> when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, that explains what I saw in 2015. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the original um, replications of the nickel hydride and lithium aluminium hydride, which he then soon removed the lithium aluminium hydride and just looked at hydri hydri hydrided nickel. Um, and it's this, it's this metal sheet over the top. What is that? Well, it might not seem, you know, why, why is Parkinson doing that? Well, he's reflecting the heat back. Is that all he's doing? No, I think he's reflecting the synthesized cold neutrinos back onto the reaction zone. And so that is one of the reasons here and here you've got effectively two types of lenses lensing the stuff. And this is effectively a parabolic mirror for these cold neutrinos. Um, and and so that's reflecting it back on the source. Is this something that we, we missed? Well, there's there's one guy that actually looked at this, and it was me three fifty six, and uh, he immediately took up the uh, notion of having this metal thing over the top, and he saw these events where the uh, reactor got unbelievably hot, and something was coming out that was able to make uh, this. Um, the, the bit over the top even itself glow incredibly brightly and when you understand what's in the book and you you have these cold neutrinos and and, and decaying between states and on, or annihilating you can get a scenario um which would explain these kind of glowing effects um so there we have it uh, it's uh, before warming up and this is uh, when it's running and and so it's it's actually <laughs> it's actually in my view this was a reflector a reflector of neutrinos uh, as one thing, not just heat. So what he's saying is essentially uh, in these new type of thinking is that you need to heat to a temperature of more than 1000 degrees C. And at that point, about 10% or, or I think at 2000 degrees C, I think about 10% of the uh, solid or liquid uh, or dense plasma matter um, is able to have uh, a particle interaction uh, 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 energies sufficient to synthesize neutrinos and antineutrinos. And so um, he says that, you know, the, a very large uh, variety of nucleides appears in the process and they do not, uh, they're, they're not in the fuel and they're not in the actual reactor uh, materials. So where did they come from? And then he's talking about the fact that there's, there's little to no hard new, uh, radiations and this can be explained by weak nuclear interactions and so on. So th this is this theory paper. This is the translation. You can gain access to it by looking at it here.
And then he, he goes into here that, uh, you know, as you go up the temperature, so the, the temperature we're looking at the uh, melting point of um, uh, uh, tungsten carbide is around this 6,200 6, degrees. You've got 60% of the, um, uh, uh, the, the electrons and ions and neutral atoms and stuff in there. They're at the level at which they can start th synthesizing um, these uh, active type of uh, cold neutrinos. And so um, he, he's basically taken this reflector idea, in my view, and uh, he's using the properties of tungsten that it maintains its solid state and the properties of silicon carbide when he can heat it up to, in the case of uh, 1,700 or 1,800 degrees uh, centigrade, as he did in the 225-day reactor that I had the pleasure to um, uh, present at ICCF22. So you've got silicon carbide here, the tungsten on the outside, and these two things together can heat up to that point where you have so hot, solid, dense matter, and uh, they can start yielding um, the uh, uh, thing that you would want to produce uh, these uh, cold neutrinos. Uh, so that would be around this point. But that's a lot lower than, you know, if you had just straight um, silicon or, or, you know, essentially you want a, a, a large amount of material uh, at this temperature in order to have a body that's able to produce even more cold neutrinos. So um, what he said to us is that the amount of material in a tungsten light bulb, the actual filament, it's really, if you've ever looked at a tungsten filament in a, a, an incandescent bowl, it's an incredibly small amount of mass. But when you start looking at what he's got here, he's got um, a, a wire, and the wire is effectively, because it's on the outside, it's heating the silicon carbide in the centre, and then the nickel, hydrogenated nickel is in the middle of that. But the silicon carbide is a hot, dense uh, material. So he's actually multiplying the amount of material. So you, whilst uh, you've only got 10% of the material uh, able to produce uh, the cold neutrinos, you've actually raised a lot more of the material to uh, the level at which uh, it can produce these uh, particles. And so that would explain his reactor redesign. So in the past, uh, he, you had the fuel in the middle, uh, and uh, the problem with that is you can get your fuel to a point where it is producing one component of the active agent, which I'm going to talk about in a little moment. Um, but uh, you you kind of use that all up. And he demonstrated that in a 225-day reactor. If you go and look at my presentation from ICCF22, you'll see that after it stopped producing excess heat, he injected more hydrogen, but it wasn't able to reinvigorate the process. So the nickel itself is doing something special, and I'm going to talk about that. And this is uh, something I wanted to talk about with respect to Mizuno. Um, and I will talk about it in this presentation. But essentially, uh, what happens is you raise it up to the temperature you raised at 1750 degrees, and the nickel inside sinters. And so you have a problem, because then you can't create another aspect of the the uh, process that's able to produce the uh, the overall excess heat and so what in his redesign what he's doing is he's putting the tungsten heater here and it's around uh, a solid bar of um uh, iron so he has 60 gram iron bar in the middle here and uh, he has the tungsten wire around the outside this is absolutely beautiful. So yes, he's only heating it to 1450 degrees. However, um, the, the the reason you're doing that is you don't want to melt the nickel, um, uh, but the nickel's far away from the thing that's producing these cold neutrinos. But what you've got is you've got a very much larger body of material that's in its own tube furnace that's able to be at the temperatures at which it is producing the cold neutrinos. This is incredibly simple to understand what's going on here. Yes, at 1450, if we look at his uh, chart here, 1450, it's around about here, you've only got 5% of the material. But instead of 5% in his original being this itty bitty bit of uh, tungsten, he's got now this whole iron bar, which has a much larger mass to produce 5% times the lot much larger mass of um, material producing the uh, cold neutrinos. And then it's able to come out 
and uh, interact with the hydrogenated nickel. And what it's actually done is, uh, if you zoom into this, I think I can do that, maybe, yeah. This actually is two layers of nickel mesh, and inside it, uh, between the two layers of nickel mesh, the same type of nickel mesh as you're using in the um, reactor by um, uh, Mizuno, he's put uh, hydrogen-saturated nickel powder, okay? And so, um, and, and the other thing is that <laughs> effectively these layers of mesh, they act as a mirror for the neutrinos on the inside. And then we'll talk about um, where that goes. It goes into this calorimeter. So the next thing is the actual the calorimeter that he's got here, where he detected a COP of 1.32 in this new configuration. And the interesting thing about this calorimeter, I kind of recognize it because I actually had to have my... Uh, a cylinder, um, uh, my sorry, my uh, chimney relined in my house, and these it looks like a standard chimney lining tube, and these like link into each other, and they actually have insulation between the inside and outside, and they're meant for you know hot flue gases to go up. So it's kind of basically <laughs> a piece of flue lining material, as far as I can make out. And then he's got a fan with a maybe a a, a thing to make the air. Uh, uh, you know, mixed and and so it's not all uh, hot air in one point and cold air in another. And then he's put it in there. So you actually have metal on the inside and you have metal on the outside. So effectively you have the same kind of reflector uh, situation that you have here, but all the way around. It's actually quite an efficient way to do it. Uh, if you're trying to reflect heat back, uh, get the best out of the reactor and also uh, to reflect the neutrinos back uh, that you're synthesizing in the way that uh, the uh, parabolic uh, reflector does in this detector that he built for his other research. And so uh, there we have it. That's that's essentially um, what's going on there. Now I want to come on to, to this uh, in, in a minute, but uh, I want to talk about something that I, I talked about a good number of years ago. So this was in July 2016. I shared this uh, uh, video called The New Fire's 100 Plus Year gen, gen, uh, Gestation. And I talked about Thomas Graham FRS and the fact that he studied the occlusion of hydrogen in metals such as palladium um, and platinum. And um, in, I think if I get to 9.33 here, uh, uh, he actually established that you need to add the absolute purity of the metallic surface being essential to the first absorbing action. Okay, so Farkamov talked about uh, in his 225 day presentation at ICCF 22, the fact that his process for doing this work that was um, established in 1868 or in, in the uh, 1860s. And then he says that established uh, that cooled, metal, cooled metals held on to their occluded hydrogen even in a vacuum and that you needed to heat the occluding material to release the gas in the case of palladium greater than 100 degrees C. Uh, and he states that the hydrogen cannot be a gas when it is taken into the metal. So he's effectively saying it needs to become uh, bare protons or something like that. Um, and then he states that the gaseous hydrogen can be absorbed at very low pressures into the heated occluding, materi occluding material. So essentially, these are all the parameters that you would see in the Mizuno reactor. Uh, going on, um, uh, 10.36... Here, um, it says palladium is much better than platinum, absorbing hydrogen under electrolytic conditions and uh, even under any conditions. Uh, and he's saying that the temperature required to expel the hydrogen, so absorbed by platinum, is found to be red heat. Um, but that's actually different uh, in the case of um, uh, palladium. Uh, it can uh, start to sorb at over 100 degrees. Um, so... Uh, if anyone's interested, I still have that t shirt. <laughs> uh, 11 12. I know we've gone there. Oh, yeah, uh, 11 12. 11 12. So, here uh, he's saying that uh, he was able, um, when heated to 100 degrees C, the palladium was able to uh, um, occlude at 982.14 volumes of gas, so volumes of it, the palladium it was uh, itself. 
And this would mean that one, uh, one cc of uh, palladium platelets would absorb nearly one litre of hydrogen gas at approximately one bar to a ratio of nearly uh, one to one. Uh, and then I wanted to look at the Canon patent, uh, patent that I mentioned here. I spelled can Canon wrong in that. Uh, but anyway, we're here. And uh, they actually refer to the word, word occlusion. And they say, secondly, in the patent, that they, I said, that secondly, in the patent, they have a phrase that looks remarkably like a summary of Graham's work. Though the amount of hydrogen stored in the hydrogen storage material depends upon the species of hydrogen storage metals, uh, uh, storage materials, hydrogen is occluded in a volume 700 to 1000 times as large as that of the hydrogen storage material. This proportion corresponds approximately to a volume reduction when hydrogen gas is liquefied. So you can have a situation where your hydrogen storage material is basically able to make them <laughs> the, the, the hydrogen at densities of liquid. And, uh, you know, the assumption is that it's going into the actual met metal itself. And, and that may be the case in palladium. And so, um, but now I want to come on to something that was observed uh, in echo fuel when it was tested by me 356 in March the 28th 2017 and he wrote back to me uh, did me 356 and he said what is this and um, you know it was interesting uh, we didn't know at the time um, and then much later on uh, he was looking at uh, oh, this was in um, October the 3rd 2017 uh, he was looking at uh, materials out of his own reactors and he observed these kind of structures which we have also subsequently observed uh, and in this center section here you can see this kind of patterns here this kind of frosting so um, uh, maybe I can zoom into that now I'll leave that as it is um, all the links will be in the video description but you have these line li linear uh, structures with these sort of 90 degrees uh, structures coming off and um, this actual sort of fading in and these boundary layers here. Well, we also saw this and this kind of structure uh, on the plates uh, that we brought back from Roish and Amaza. And here's one such structure where you have this uh, boundary and then inside the boundary you have your fading in and then you have these kind of like uh, structures with the, the, the crystals coming off. And I'd already seen this before, and I'd already seen this obviously in the ECHO and the uh, work uh, and observations by ME356. But by the time I'd got to this, I knew, knew kind of what I was recognizing here. And this was actually observed by Takaaki Matsumoto. And here it is. Uh, and again, you've got this boundary on the outside, slight fading in, and then these sort of straight lines with these crystals growing off. And if we go down, here's, here's another such structure. Uh, and he literally calls these scatic itonic hydrogen atoms frost. So he's actually saying they're like crystals of this type of special form of hydrogen. And then on the second page, he says um, a droplet. So uh, he says so like itonic hydrogen droplets. Yeah, scattered itonic uh, hydrogen atoms droplets. So they're not frozen out, but uh, you can see them spread out over the surface. And so these kind of things uh, have now been observed by multiple parties. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that uh, was also observed by uh, Me356. And uh, here also, where you have these structures coming out. And uh, under SEM, when something is getting brighter, it tends to be a, a heavier element. So it's like it's going onto the carbon tape and the material is bleeding out of the processed material. And as it's traveling along, um, it's uh, leaving these heavier elements. And we saw the same thing on Hutchison uh, treated samples where you had these things going across the surface and uh, at the ends they were producing heavier elements. So we've seen this around, around, uh, over a wide range of different um, uh, materials and in uh, experiments. And, and so um, uh, the, the implication is, and, and what I'm saying is that that, that, that is, um, uh, effectively uh, what is going on when the hydrogen effectively disappears and you get these uh, densities of hydrogen which is like uh, uh, equivalent to <laughs> effectively uh, liquidizing the hydrogen you're actually forming uh, this stable kind of dense hydrogen
And then when you combine that uh, with uh, Tadehiko Mizuno's uh, work, um, essentially you've got the nickel mesh here, and uh, on the nickel mesh you have uh, palladium that's been uh, rubbed on there. The palladium is able to absorb this uh, one to one ratio of um, uh, hydrogen uh, isotopes, and then it, in direct contact, I've discussed this at depth with Alan Goldwater over the last uh, sort of uh, since uh, Mizuno came out. Essentially, you, if you can imagine these two fingers here are your uh, palladium and this is the nickel. The nickel is not very good at capturing uh, hydrogen, but the palladium, as Thomas Graham showed in 1868, is incredibly good at low uh, pressures and uh, 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 not very high temperatures of absorbing the um, uh, hydrogen into its bulk uh, to extreme densities. And then if you heat it up to like 100 degrees, it'll start disorbing it. And then what we're saying is, and actually uh, Matsumoto in one of his papers, he specifically says, it might even be this paper here, um, but he specifically says that what happens is nickel does not absorb the hydrogen. This is why I was saying the other day that um, uh, Ficardi was saying that it's absorbing into the, the nickel. I don't believe it is. I believe that uh, this 300 to 400 degree temperature um, the nickel is forming these uh, dense uh, uh, material from the hydrogen, um, which uh, has also uh, been observed in Mitri 56 and in our uh, glow stick experiments where we saw the pressure drop at a specific temperature uh, to, to, to vacuum um, when we were putting hydrogen in and Mitri 56 kept loading hydrogen, it kept disappearing. Um, and so what I'm saying is you have the palladium in direct contact with the nickel. And so the palladium disorbs some of its uh, atomic hydrogen. And that then gets formed into this uh, itonic state uh, by the nickel. And then that effectively is the material that uh, Takaki Matsumoto in the early 90s and in 1990 to 1994 described how it can both fission and uh, fusion materials um, uh, and produce a lot of the observed effects. Um, and so uh, effectively what you've got here is, is quite a nice setup when you think about it because you have a material that's very good at getting hydrogen right next to the nickel in the state that it needs to be to optimally then convert into the state that then can go on and do transmutations. And then you also have the heater, and the heater is uh, able to um, uh, produce uh, the kind of material that is necessary to uh, do the work. And so if you, if you look at the thinking, and if you actually look at what um, uh, uh, Parkamov's conclusion is here, it becomes very, very clear. He's saying, this hypothesis predicts the possibility of taking fuel out of the hot zone of reactors, which allows to ease the heat load on structural materials and increase the thermal coefficient. The operability of such reactors has been tested experimentally. So what is he saying? He's saying, well, the very hot zone here, in this case, the hot zone was around the nickel fuel. So when you wanted to raise the temperature, you ended up breaking the structures that are able to form the active form of hydrogen. Uh, in this case, you can create a much larger bulk of material that produces the secondary uh, uh, aspect of the process. But the, the fuel is in a much larger area around it with this insulator in between. So it raises to a temperature at which it can become active and it can do its work. But the thing that's playing on the material um, that is in the nickel um, mesh and the, the, the nickel powder um, is able to be recharged. So um, unlike in his 225-day reactor, he couldn't reactivate this core. In theory, this could be reactivated. And this is what you're seeing effectively in Mizuno's mesh here. You have the hot bit in the middle, it's radiating out, the palladium's there as a hydrogen storage material. Um, uh, in fact, the, <laughs> if you think about it, the, 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 the nickel, uh, hydrogen loaded nickel is also in the state that it can uh, uh, ex, ex, uh, dissolve that hydrogen that it's loaded with. Um, and then uh, it can then 
uh, uh, be converted into the right form. It has something that's able to produce the, the cold neutrinos in the center. And then you have reflectors all the way around. It's a highly polished piece of metal. This highly polished piece of metal is effectively the same as the highly polished uh, uh, tube that the uh, reactor, the C3 reactor is, the latest reactor from Parkamov is in. And, and so that's reflecting these cold neutrinos back. So if I was to advise people what to do, um, what I would suggest is to not have a big heater that spread the heat out evenly. I would have a heater in the middle that um, is ideally made of tungsten, um, uh, probably in a silicon carbide sheath or even a silicon carbide uh, heater element. But I think tungsten's better. It can go to a much higher temperature. So you have the tungsten filament in there. Now, uh, tungsten's got a very low resistivity, uh, so you need quite a bit of the wire, but overall, um, you can get it to a much, much higher temperature. Uh, and so there'll be the same thermal, sorry, the same electrical power going in. But what the electrical power is able to do is very, very different to just merely heating it with infrared. It is, in theory, producing these uh, ultra-low energy neutrinos, that then playing secondary part of the process. Then, your palladium needs to be uh, around the, the parameters as set out in 1868 by Thomas Graham, FRS, uh, to load the low uh, um, uh, pressure hydrogen into the palladium, or deuterium into the palladium, and then you need to raise it above a threshold which it starts to disorb. That goes into the nickel, which is in a state where it can, it, it, its crystal structure or whatever hasn't been distorted by over temperatures. It can then create the active structures. And if it does create, for instance, the plasmoids um, that are observed by Bogdanovich, and uh, um, Takaki Matsumoto is very clear that ultimately he was replicating the work of Kenny's shoulders. These plasmoids by Bogdanovich, when they've been synthesized, he's witnessed them traveling around on material uh, at microns uh, uh, over a period of time, two days after the reactor has stopped. And so the beauty of a mesh is it's an XY grid. So if you've got an area which is optimum uh, at a particular time for creating these plasmoids of this combination of material, uh, a combination of factors, it's then able to travel down a piece of nickel and, and along a piece of nickel, interacting with the metals uh, uh, that are there, the nickel and the palladium. The palladium is likely to fission, as observed by Matsumoto. Look at his papers. It will fission to the typical elements you see in the crust. Uh, the fusion elements will end up going to ID, most likely to typical elements that you see in the crust. And additionally, Alan Goldwater has found that by using the tap water, you end up with calcium carbonate in there. And that has carbon and oxygen. And we have seen that with carbon and oxygen, you can synthesize silicon. And so you will see silicon. And that with uh, silicon and oxygen, or as uh, Sander Esan and, and Bokris found when they were replicating George Oshawa, they found that they were getting two carbons, two oxygen goes to four helium and iron. So I would expect to see iron. So when we get the analysis back from the Mizuno reactors, I would expect to see silicon, calcium, iron, obviously. Um, and uh, I think that ideally you would want the carbon in the calcium carbonate to come from some sort of, you know, maybe from seashells or somehow, um, where the carbon was uh, uh, bioactive, i.e. it's not dead carbon, it's not fossil carbon. Uh, and, you know, that would, uh, in my view, be better carbon. And so you have very many things that are in there as fuel, but the active things are being able to create the structures um, uh, with the nickel and being able to create the cold neutrinos. And effectively, this, in my view, is what's going on here. You have a bulk of material. So you could actually make a, a, a central core heater for here that was learning from this. You could even have a, a tungsten rod in the middle, like a welding rod. OK, and around the welding rod, you had an insulator like Parkamov has got here. OK, and I wouldn't use alumina. I would use uh, silicon carbide because uh, alumina becomes a conductor, at, uh, uh, as we found out. Uh, but Nernst obviously discovered in the early part of the last century. Um, but uh, so the silicon carbide, then then your tungsten uh, heater wire, and then the tungsten in the middle becomes a much larger body that you can heat up to the temperatures at which are hitting these target areas here. 
you know, at the two, three thousand degrees centigrade, and you have a large bulk of the material, but you're not actually putting any more electrical power into the heater. And you would have that at the center, and then on the outside, you would you you would use the materials that are more likely to create more plasmoids. So you would you would have calcium carbon, but the carbon needs to be live carbon. That means it has 14 carbon in there. And um you know, essentially, that's what, you, what you're getting. So when you start to really understand what's going on, it really kind of makes sense what Parkamov has been doing all this time and how his progressions of experiments have, have gone and why he seems to be able to achieve things when other people don't. Because he's, he's, not, he's not guessing and stabbing in the dark. These are logical decisions based on understanding proven over decades of research. So thank you very much for your time. And I really hope that this will inspire people that are doing uh, Tadihako and Mizuno work or even this. I mean, this effectively is a replication or an analog of Tadihako and Mizuno in a way. It's just much simpler. And the airflow calorimeter is <laughs> incredibly simple because it's just a, you know, a <laughs> a exhaust pipe from a furnace, you know, like like a your boiler in your house. It's an off-the-shelf component and slightly modified. Um, and it provides several purposes that I believe uh, he was already thinking about all the way back down here because of his work like this. So thank you very much for your time and uh, here's for a great 2020.